Okay guys, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna make, you know, feel free to raise your hands, talk out, ask questions as we go along with this. Um, I think I'm gonna learn a lot more from you guys over the next couple days than you will from me. I just have the specific application that I found really useful that I wanna share with you. But um, you guys all are the tech experts, so I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you guys. Um, I'm gonna screencast this using a program called ScreenFlow, which is my favorite screencasting software program on the Mac. Um, I love the people at TechSmith, and I think Camtasia Mac, which is the Mac client, is getting there, but I don't think it's where ScreenFlow is right now. Um, so I'm going to record that here. It's going to affect my ability to demo ScreenFlow for you, but it's what's running in the background. So I'm going to start that right now. Little icon up here. Record. Uh oh, here it comes. Okay. So, um, before I even begin, the little device that I'm using here is made by Wacom, just like your bamboos are. This is called the Graphire Wireless. They actually don't make these anymore. They sell them online, though. Um, I really, really like this one above the new wireless one, the Intuos, made by Wacom, for simple reasons that make class time so much easier, like it can hold the pen. I mean, that's like a, that's a big deal. You saw right there, if you, that's a huge deal for me, because then I can use it as a clicker also. Um, it's got this big space, and I could literally leave that room right now, and I would have no delay. So this is a really, really great device, and I love it. Um, the other thing that is keeping me with these, rather than moving straight to an iPad and using something like Doceri, which I think some people might be comfortable with, is that I can see my cursor right there, which is a big deal, because then I can stare at my webcam while I'm recording here rather than having to look down, which is, which is what I found when I've used my iPad. Um, also, there's absolutely no pen delay at all, totally real time, which makes it really authentic for the students. There is a learning curve, so just you know, take your shoes off, you know, crack open a beer and do the alphabet like 100 times when you get home and you'll be good you know, the next day. So there is a little bit of a learning curve, but what you gain in not having an image here you know, what you lose in that, you gain in speed of it. So it's, it's a really, really great device. So I'm going to get started right now. Um, and the title of this presentation is Flip Teaching, um, the whole picture. Now, I know flip teaching is kind of a buzzword right now, and I'm not a fan of buzzwords, really. But I'm going to use the term because it's getting a lot of attention in the media. And I think it really describes what I'm going to talk about. But one of the things that I want to do for you guys is demystify what I think that term means, and then more than anything, demystify the tools needed to do it so you guys can go and do it. And I apologize ahead of time if you guys are already, which I'm sure you are, really, really strong with a lot of the tools I'm gonna show. But I, that's, that's the most important thing for me, is to make this accessible. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the Khan Academy, some positive things and some negative things that I do see. Um, to me, Looking at it through that lens, the only real glaring negative thing, if it's getting millions and millions of hits today, if I was Sal Khan, I would have a button right there at the top that says, if you are a teacher, click this, and here's how I do this. You know, and, and you really got to search to find out the tools. He's using a bamboo, he's using Camtasia Studio. You know, but it, it seems intuitive to us, but I think a lot of people think it's a lot harder than it is. It's actually really, really, really simple to do. Um, so we've got a lot of people driven to that site. Let's just loop in teachers and empower them also. So that's something that's really important to me. Um, resources, as we're going through this, I have a website, flipteaching.com, that looks like this. And the purpose of this website is basically just to have all the tools located for you. So there's a lot of stuff that I'm not going to talk about today, but you can go and access it. And I have basically a database of all the tools I think you would need on any platform um, to make this happen. I just want to show you the way the website's set up a little bit. The first thing, when you open up, I have a diff some various different flip teaching models for you to look at. Um, this is the one that I do in my classroom. I call it the Explore Flip Apply model, and I'll talk more about it. Um, but some other models, just so you can get an idea of what we're talking about here. Um, down at the bottom, some resources, past slides, some research, websites. And then up here, 
I'll be talking about the four steps that I think go into making a really, really good um, online video using screencasting. One is writing, screencasting, tracking that to make sure students have reflected on it, and then sharing it. And then there's some all-in-one devices that we're seeing right now, things like Show Me and Replay Note and that kind of stuff on the iPad. So you would click on any one of these, and then it would have links to it on whatever software you're on. Okay, so everything's here. You don't have to write anything down. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about various workshops, you could click here and send me an email. Um, and I've done one or two workshops that have gone really well at other school districts. So it's something I'm getting really excited about also. So I'd be happy to, to talk with you guys. All right, so let's get going. There's my email and my phone number. You can call me anytime if you guys come across any problems or you need any help or um, something you are particularly excited about you want to talk about. Um, so my story, I got into this, you know, we think about everyone's here I really feel because we love teaching, right? We love our students. We love the way technology affects things, like borderline obsessed with it, you know? I mean, that's why we're all here. I mean, that's the truth. So, like, what are our triggers in the classroom because of that? For me, it makes me a little vulnerable. Like, I really, really care about teaching. And sometimes to the point where I can, you know, just honestly take something a student might say a little bit more personally than I should because I care so much about it. Um, and for me, my triggers were always walking down the hallway and seeing kids scribble down their homework and, and copying it, that kind of thing. And the main trigger for me was I knew how important it was for them to do that. And I knew how much it would just screw them over in the classroom because they copied it. And I also felt bad for them because they're so stressed out about getting into college. And I teach 17, 18 year olds that they're just doing that because their minds aren't thinking about the moral implication. They're thinking about the grade. So I just really got frustrated with that and just watching people's eyelids close in class while I was talking. Just really, those two things just drove me crazy. So one of my goals over the last five years was how to address those two things simultaneously to make the homework experience more meaningful and to make the classroom experience more meaningful. And that's the lens that I look at everything through, because those are my triggers. Kids, kids cursing in class, kids talking when I'm talking, those aren't my triggers. I'm really bad at classroom management. But those, those things are my triggers. So I, if I could address those, I can have a meaningful, awesome experience in the classroom. So I started off um, trying to address those using a smart board. I accidentally hit the record button, and it captured my whole class period, and I noticed that at the end of the day when I saw the file on the computer. Um, but I wanted to be able to do more of that kind of stuff at home. So I got a tablet PC, which was awesome, mainly because there was no pen delay and I could write directly in Microsoft Word, which I thought was amazing. But I wanted to get a Mac and there was no Mac tablet. Um, so I discovered these things. Um, it's a company that builds the software that underlies the airliner and all those other devices too. So those all are fine as well. Um, so I fell in love with these. They're multi-platform. I can upgrade my computer and use this one. I've had this one now for four years, and I've gotten three computers, so it's still going fine. Then I realized I could just capture my screencast. So if I was really going to model what I'm going to talk to you about today, you would have watched last night the screencast of this presentation. It was really fast. It doesn't matter because you can rewind it. Okay. Um, you would have come to class today, heard my voice, associated that voice with the screencast, gotten a little comfortable because you formed some relationship with that voice, and then we could spend time right now in the workshop. Right. That's sort of the traditional flipped model. But the truth is, I recorded that screencast sitting in a corner at the O'Hare Airport trying not to look like a weirdo, you know, bent over. <laughs> It's the truth, so that's how easy it was. So you're literally going to hear people like, you know, calling out you know, plane delays and all kinds of stuff. But while I was doing it, I was thinking to myself, I can only do it because I'm using this device now, because you know, I can take this anywhere with myself. I was actually using my bamboo right here, which is what you guys all have. This is the older version. So that's a little bit about my story. Um, this is a quote from Farb Nevi. He's a CEO of a test prep site called Rocket.com. You might have heard of that. I think this quote for me, and if I, if some of you have seen this presentation before, really defines what's happening right now. You know, I, 
The, the problem is not the tools. We have the tools. We have too many tools. The problem is the overlap between pedagogy. You know, the field of research is, you might have heard of TPAC and all that kind of stuff. This is really, to me, what, what's really important. It's not about the tools, but it's about how the tools overlap with the pedagogy, things James was talking about earlier. And I think he really, really articulates this well in this quote. So because of that, we're going to look at the research first. And it comes out of an area called cognitive load theory, um, ma mainly done by a guy named John Sweller out of Australia. Um, then we're going to look at the intervention that comes out of the research so that we feel like we can convince people in a professional development workshop to use it. Um, another buzzword, I'm calling it tab casting, but that just really means screen casting what you're doing with a tablet. So, you know, reverse instruction or whatever. I like this term because it brings together the tablet and the screen casting. But you can call it whatever you want. Um, then the design that you're going to use the tool for. So it doesn't end with just the tool, where I think a lot of professional development does. Um, we're going to call that flip teaching, reverse instruction, whatever. And then you guys are going to be left with some production specifics on all platforms. That's what I hope to do. Is there anything up here that you guys don't see that you'd like me to talk about? Or just interrupt me. All right, so the research. I find the education, I think it don't matter where you go to school, Italy, America, Brazil, it's all the same. It's all just memorization. And it don't matter how long you can remember anything, just so you can parrot it back for the test. And I got this idea for a school I would like to start, something called the five-minute university. <laughs> and the idea is that in five minutes, you learn what the average college graduate remembers five years after he or she's out of school. <laughs> Would the cost of like $20? <laughs> that might seem like a lot of money, $20 just for five minutes. But that's for like a tuition, <laughs> cap and a gown rental, graduation picture, snacks, everything. Everything included. I was going to stop after the five minute university, but I love the way he says snacks. <laughs> so I, I, I had to keep it going. Uh, Father Guido Sarducci from Saturday Night Live. Um, you know, it's a funny thing, but what fascinates me about this, and in longer workshops I'll show the whole clip, what fascinates me about this is the moment he says the five minute university and he says what that is, everyone claps. And it's not like a clap because they think it's funny, it's more like an empathy clap. Like they all like totally get it. And they, you know, this is in the early 70s, I think. And I think they totally get it because we all sort of can get a little bit of that as well, you know. And the ability to empathize with this while, you know, a lot of it's, well, oh, that's what school's all about. You know, some, some of it just sucks. It, it speaks to how we're looking at educating children. Are we looking at it through a lens of cognition? Like what really works? What promotes meaningful learning? Or are we looking at it through a lens of just delivering instruction? So I like to start off with this. And if we take a little look at a model of our brain, and I, we know the brain is a super dynamic place and it can't be reduced down to two boxes. But let's say that we're going to think about it in terms of two spaces. One we'll call the working memory. Um, that's where live processing is happening. So when I'm talking to you, this is, that's where you're chewing on this information. And one we'll call the long-term memory where you're forming schema. So your phone number is now one thing. It's not just a bunch of seven digits. Okay, that's where that happens. Um, but the problem is the working memory can be clogged up by the information and the environment. So the information is also just hard. Your calculus is just hard. It's got more of an information load. Yeah. I'm a vignette because I've done a lot of tablet training and I've seen teachers trying to use the tablet but they can't pick the right answer because their brain's so busy working the tablet that they can't pick the answer. Yeah. And then you got to stop them and go, hold on, what are you trying to answer? Oh, yeah. And I think our kids go through that a lot. Yeah, so that's, Sweller would call that intrinsic cognitive load. It's got high element interactivity. you got to do things together. you got to coordinate them versus something that's like step one, step two, step three. So you can have things that have 100 tasks and the information load is really small. You have something that's two tasks and a high information load. Like taking a picture, a really good picture with a camera, you've got to think about a lot of things simultaneously. So, um, 
and the environment load as well. You know, I talk kind of fast, so that's high environment load. It's the things the teacher are doing. It's the white space on paper. It's the way the classroom looks. I mean, I don't think any of us walked in here and felt stressed out into this building. I think we were all like really excited to be in here. Um, so if those two things get too high, a student can experience cognitive overload. And in that case, this information is not going to enter in here. Okay? And we've all seen that happen with our students. We know what that looks like. So really, the goal is to minimize both of these. And then the information can go in, and it can get processed, and it can go back, and it can go back again. And then the student's forming schema every time they do that, and they're learning. Okay? So this is the title of my dissertation at USF, and it's a long thing to chew on. But what we found out, and I'll talk more about this application, it was an application of flip teaching called pre-training. You might have heard of it before. And what we basically did is we said, well, they used to think that this was a static thing, right? That no information was just hard. So calculus has just got a set intrinsic load, right? But we're realizing now that you can actually make information appear to be less complex to kids without actually sacrificing the content of the material. So what we did is we took a whole unit on equilibrium, and we picked that because that was the most complex unit of the, the year based on the research. And the kids, one, 20, 20 kids out of, a, out of 40 kids who were randomly chose for this experiment, every single day watched, before class, watched a five-minute video on what they were going to learn in class that next day. So they'd come to class having seen a five-minute clip that was, gave them the basic definitions and the basic concepts of what they were going to see. It didn't teach them everything. It just kind of whetted their appetite a little bit about it. So they came to class having been tricked into having a little prior knowledge. So what, what we did with those kids is basically it showed that that information went back and forth a little bit with those kids, whereas it didn't with the others. So they were able to, to chunk those elements that John was talking about into individual elements, okay? So they actually experienced a little bit less information load. So then after we looked at the data, they performed a little bit better and they had less mental effort when solving the problems. So for those kids, it felt easier, but they were doing the exact same thing in the exact same period of time. So we were using the screencasting to trick them into having prior knowledge rather than using it for online instructions or anything like that. And really, what we wanted them to do, we said, watch them about five minutes before you walk in the door. So kids were sitting in the hallways on their iPhones, plugged in, you know, watching these little five-minute things, walking into class, and they're like, I got this. I, I get what it's about, even if it was a really complicated thing. Um, and then that's what I did all year long in my class. So that was their only homework were pre-training videos, which was pretty cool. Any questions? Yeah. How do you say trick them into to having prior learning? Because aren't they learning at that? Yeah, they are. I, it's, it's just kind of the idea that they don't really realize that we're just, we were trying to just manipulate this, this here. You know, they, they were, in their mind, I didn't tell them all this. I just said, we're, you're going to watch these five-minute videos. It's going to give you a little bit of background information on what you're going to learn in class. What we were trying to do was... What, they, what we're really trying to get them to do were to chunk, if there were like seven things that they were having to think about, chunk those into maybe four things. Chunk those interactions that John was talking about, of all the things that kids had to do. Tricking them into already having a little bit of knowledge, so that when I then stood up here and did direct instruction, God forbid, they, it was easier for them. You know? And I actually did lecture through that whole experiment, I lectured every day just so that we could see how that affected those kids. But that was a really, really powerful application because homework was like five minutes, but super meaningful. 